Everywhere we look in society, we see forms of symbolic representation, which identify and illustrate our cultural ethos. Symbols carry multiple meanings depending on the context and culture in which they appear. They are an important and integral element in understanding culture. Symbols function to represent a value or belief. They do not always remain the same, but can transform through the ages and through various processes of cultural adaptation. One of the most prevalent and particularly multi-purpose symbols in history is the skull. Skulls have been used to honor the dead, promote eternal wisdom, and to warn against corruption and temptations of the flesh. In this video, I will explore the representation and symbolic meaning of this icon in historical cultures, subcultures, religion, and art, with an exploration into how the flesh-stripped head went from substantial icon to appropriated pop image and found its way into the visual vocabulary of urban life, decorating t-shirts, bookshelves, lamps, and commodity art exhibitions, repurposed and recast by artists and designers what has become of one of the most iconic cultural symbols of our time. In Latin America, skull icons have a long and storied history. In Aztec culture, like many ancient cultures, the head was believed to be a source of human power and energy. Starting around 1200 AD, the Aztecs were recorded to have made human sacrifices to the gods. The remains of these sacrificial victims were kept as relics. Skulls and bones were bleached, painted, and put on display. In Mexico, the Aztecs culture believed life on earth to be something of an illusion. Death was a positive step forward to a higher level of consciousness. For the Aztecs, skulls were a positive symbol, not only of death, but also of rebirth. By 300 AD, skull imagery became synonymous with Mexico's Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead ceremony, in which it continues to play a prominent role, invoking themes of death, and the transience of life. Day of the Dead is a holiday that celebrated the lives of those who had deceased. One of the most popular forms of Mexican ornament, a calavera, Spanish for skull, made from sugar, where each sugar skull represented an individual and their name was often inscribed on the forehead of the skull and meant to honor the deceased. These sugar skulls were placed on the graves of deceased relatives as offerings. Mexicans contend with the misfortune of death, but also regard it as the ultimate liberation. The skull crept into European decorative art in the mid-1300s, after the bubonic plague killed a quarter of the population. It served as a memento mori, interpreted as, remember you must die, symbolizing both mortality and celebration. The practice of decorating European churches with bones and skulls began as early as the 15th century, though it ended by the 19th when most countries outlawed the exhuming of bones. Famous examples of skeleton adorned churches include Poland's Chapel of Skulls built in 1776 and the Chapel of Bones in Evora, Portugal, both of which boast creepy skull lined ceilings and walls. Christians associate skulls with penitent sainthood and the washing away of human sin. Christianity portrayed some images of Jesus on the crucifix with a skull at the base of the cross. This is believed to be Adam, the first human to have sinned. 
Jesus Christ's blood flowing from his wounds into the skull washes away Adam's sin and the sins of all mankind. The skull position under the cross of Jesus also stands for Christ's victory over death. In the arts, there were popular symbolic forms of works that included skull symbolism. Vanitas is a type of symbolic work of art associated with still life painting in the 16th and 17th centuries. The Latin word means vanity and loosely translated corresponds to the meaninglessness of earthly life and the transient nature of all earthly goods and pursuits. Also, an overlapping motif, the memento more, Latin for remember that you will die, is an artistic or symbolic reminder of the inevitability of death. The expression memento more developed with the growth of Christianity, which emphasized heaven, hell, and salvation of the soul in the afterlife. Peter Klaus's Vanitas still life painting presented a skull, which represents the passing of time and death. A painting like this reminds the viewer of the limitations of life. The message is to avoid becoming attached to worldly possessions and rather focus instead on higher things and to live a God-fearing and virtuous life. A.C. Allen Gilbert, a prominent American illustrator, is especially remembered for a widely published drawing titled, All is Vanity. The drawing employs visual pun in which the scene of a woman admiring herself in a mirror, when viewed from a distance, appears to be a human skull. The title is also a pun, as this type of dressing table is also known as a vanity. In the 1700s, pirates flew flags with skulls and crossbones to signify a rogue identity. It communicated that the crew didn't follow the law of any country and would stop at nothing to win a fight. This was a way for pirates to terrorize victims into surrendering. The black flag with the skull and cross femur bones was a warning of death. The German army incorporated the Totemkopf, German for a dead man's head, into the uniforms of Adolf Hitler's bodyguards and concentration camp guards. The skull for them stood for death before dishonor, meaning the soldiers would rather die than surrender. Also during World War II, many propaganda posters included imagery of skulls. The Allies distributed propaganda posters utilizing skull imagery which portrayed Hitler as death or causing deaths. The Axis posters warned of impending death to Allied fighters employing skulls and bones. The use of skulls in this manner inspired more artists in the years after World War II to incorporate skulls in their art. As you can see, there are multiple representations and meanings of skull iconography. Skull imagery has long been associated with death and its transcendence, human spirituality, if you will. It is a reminder of immortality, the transitory nature of life, and by its existence after the end of chronological life, the limitations of human knowledge and understanding. So when did skulls come to North America? 
It all started in the 1920s and 30s when American artists began to experiment with mural making and looked to the South for inspiration. Mural culture in Mexico was already well established through artists such as Diego Rivera and rife with skull imagery drawn from the Day of the Dead tradition. These icons eventually made their way into American art, such as Georgia O'Keeffe's Head with Broken Pot. But American culture may have also helped take the skull from serious cultural rich symbol to campy mass produced Mall of America approved decorative image. In 1976, Andy Warhol produced Skulls, a series of six pictures of a human skull in vibrant colors. Andy's obsession with the iconic and with death and his revolution in image repetition are apparent in this work. These are the features that inspired his artistic principle and thereby changed Western visual culture. Andy's skulls repeatedly represent the icon of the skull an almost literal multiplication of death. The compilation of these six canvases provides the perfect grouping of replication. By replicating the same motif, Warhol simultaneously multiplies and dilutes the power of the imagery. By repeating the skull subject as a powerful symbol of death, the artist both magnifies and desensitizes our fear of mortality. Warhol's point is that even death becomes ordinary when perceived through the contemporary action of repetition. This repetition is a comment on consumer culture and mass production and its effect on something so powerful as the skull and its manifestation of death. By the 1970s, the skull was being used by subcultures as a rebellious, radical signifier by bikers and youth of the time. Motorcycle enthusiasts and gangs, such as the Hells Angels, used the symbol to signify their bravado. It represented the reckless fearlessness of the gang. Punk was another important subculture that also used imagery, including the skull, to signify the youthful cry of rebellion against consumerism, the establishment, and the fashion industry. Heavy metal, on the other hand, appropriated the skull into its imagery and co-opted to sell a lifestyle. Heavy metal created a merchandising empire of t-shirts, flags, and memorabilia toting the skull insignia of each band. The skull was designated as an aesthetic of heavy metal and co-opted as a commodity to sell merchandise. This was just the beginning of the movement of the icon into merchandise, commodification, and mass production that shaped it into a campy representation of its former self. These days, we see the skull symbol adorned on everything from toddler socks to women's luxury purses. Skulls have become a virtual modern spectacle. The use of not only the skull, but the appropriation of the Day of the Dead sugar skulls into hollow visual communication and commodity items have taken the icon from historically rich to banal kitsch. Stephen Heller in Underground Mainstream said, Commercial culture depends on the theft of intellectual property for its livelihood. Mass marketers steal ideas from visionaries, alter them slightly if at all, then reissue them to the public as new products. In the process, what was once insurgent becomes commodity, and what was once the shock of the new becomes the shock of the novel. Once a powerful symbol of death, the bony remains are now cliché, maybe even boring. The appropriation and mass production of skull iconography has made it mainstream and ordinary. The skull has become an image of commodification used to sell everything from candles to shoes. 
Fashion is a prime example of where the skull has been appropriated by the mainstream and rendered decorative, becoming a contemporary figure of fashion. Alexander McQueen is credited with popularizing a fashion trend with stylized skulls, including skull-decorated bags and scarves. His high-end luxury brand casts the icon throughout his collection. But what does the icon stand for? Is this an appropriation of Memento Mori of Renitas? McQueen's appropriation of the skull seems ironic then to be used to sell high-end luxury goods. Was McQueen making a comment about the futility of purchasing his brand, almost laughing at his consumer? Or is this appropriation purely for aesthetic purposes rooted in the punk ethos? Co-opting the new, challenging and extraordinary, and repackaging them as profitable commodities is part of the essence of fashion. It's ironic how punk images such as the skull and crossbones motif have progressed from emblem of counter-cultural anti-fashion anarchy to a ubiquitous luxury label. A victim of mass marketing and mass production, once an edgy icon with deep symbolism, has now been reduced to aesthetic commodity. Damien Hirst, an English artist and entrepreneur, presented in his art exhibition For the Love of God, an 18th century human skull covered in over 8,000 diamonds. It has been defined as a representation of memento mori and vanitas, but the materials used on the skull claims victory over decay. The skull represents a conquest over the temporal, physical, and ugly aspect of death. The skull is the last effigy of the living face but Damien's skull is made of materials of extreme durability. Platinum lasts forever, diamonds are eternal. The skull proclaims victory over decay. For the love of God acts as a reminder that our existence on earth is transient. Hearst combined the imagery of classic memento mori with, his, with inspiration drawn from Aztec skulls and the Mexican love of decoration and attitude towards death. He explains of death, you don't like it, so you disguise it or you decorate it to make it look like something bearable, to such an extent that it becomes something else. Although the proclamation of the Aztec skull is one of transcendentalism, a description of desire at the expense of material value, it seems that Hearst's skull expresses a process of capitalist profit motivation, which, of course, could be a worthy antagonist to the spiritual alternative if it were not for the fact that these departures are utterly succeeded by the conceptual supremacy of money. The exceedingly expensive art piece cost upwards of 14 million pounds to fabricate and was for sale for a staggering 50 million pounds, makes me question the authenticity of the piece and the artist himself. It is ironic that the appropriation of memento mori and vanitas has become a commodity and as a result can be purchased, a futile purchase defined by its transient nature. The piece seems to teeter into expensive, vulgar camp territory. This impression of greedy commerce is reinforced when Hearst shamelessly cashes in by offering a limited edition roll of Damien Hearst wallpaper for £7,000 or a charm bracelet for eleven. The appropriation of culture translated into a mass-produced commodity for capitalist profit. This can be said for a large degree of the mass-produced skull iconography of today. With skulls emerging not only in fashion but in home decor, all the signifiers of the icon have been reduced to cheap kitsch through mass production for consumption of a now banal expression of subverted culture. The skull has been appropriated for purely aesthetic purposes. Just like in Andy Warhol's skulls, the repetition and mass production of the skull has watered down the meaning of the icon and robbed it of its cultural significance. It has become merely another pop culture image in Western mass media. Appropriation and mass production removes signifiers from icons, especially when it is used for commodification, although there are some icons that will always hold its signifiers regardless of its use as a commodity. Shepard Ferry, a well-known American contemporary street artist, graphic designer, activist, and illustrator, adopted a skull from a biker gang for one of his t-shirts. The image was reproduced as a t-shirt and added to Ferry's Obey fashion line.
Whether through homage or plagiarism, Walmart copied Shepard's skull image and mass-produced Fairy's appropriation, adding it to the Superstore's own fashion line. A shopper at Walmart recognized the skull motif's origin and angrily protested as it was an exact duplicate of the Totenkopf, used in the Nazi German uniforms. Walmart's t-shirts became a nationwide controversy and the store ultimately removed the offensive t-shirt from its shelves. It was eventually discovered that Ferry was first to appropriate the icon into his t-shirt design and when confronted, offered the following. I am anti-fascist and pro-peace, but a lot of people probably just thought I was being antagonistic. I'm not proud of making a Nazi skull graphic, but it was not intended maliciously or to be offensive. When I made that graphic, I was referencing a biker logo and it was only brought up to me later that it was the SS skull logo. In some cases, the appropriation of icons will always signify deep connotations and designers need to be sensitive and mindful of the rooted history icons carry. Formerly an emblem of evil and mortality, the skull has been appropriated and transformed into an avant-garde design element used in art, interiors, and style of the moment. Whether embellished on costly t-shirts or encrusted with diamonds, the skull in most cases no longer signifies the deep-rooted symbolism. It has become a contemporary ironic commodity figure in life today.